Good afternoon, ladies. It is, I don't think I've ever spoken to an entirely female audience. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to be talking today. Oh, a guy just showed up. I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to be talking today about a few issues that matter to me most as the editor in chief of the Neurology Journal, uh, and that is how we report the results that come to us and why they always aren't as ideal as we would like them to be. Uh, I have some disclosures, uh, just in the sake of for the sake of transparency. I want you to see them. Um, there's, I have no industry support. This is not allowed to the editor-in-chief of neurology by the bylaws of the association. So here's a really big problem in publishing, particularly the publishing of clinical trials. Let's assume for the moment that there's a perfectly designed study, which rarely happens, that the data analyses are handled perfectly which rarely happens, that the reporting is entirely accurate and transparent, which rarely happens, and you as the reader then look at the trial to inform your practice. I'm going to show you a graphic that was originally published in The Economist in 2013 that goes through for us why uh, many results are simply not accurate. Let's assume for the moment that you have a thousand hypotheses you're interested in testing. People have done studies and estimated that about 10 percent of those hypotheses may be true. So we have a thousand hypotheses here. 10 percent or a hundred are true. You don't know that. You haven't done the study yet, but that's the assumption we're starting with. Your test usually allows a false positive rate of 5 percent. That's the P.05 statistical level. That means there are 45 false positives allowed from those remaining 900 false hypotheses that turn out to be false positives. Because many clinical trials are only powered to detect 80 percent of differences, that means there are going to be 20 false negatives. This is assuming, again, that everything has been done perfectly. What happens then when you as the investigator or you as the reader have to determine the true true? What you'll see is a true consisting of true trues and false positives, or 125 hypotheses that you see as true, knowing that only a hundred are. And you don't know which of them are not true. And the rest are negatives, but they include some false negatives. If you do the math, and there are 875 negative results, 20 percent, 20 of which are false negatives, that's an accuracy rate of 97 percent. So your negative outcomes will have an accuracy of 97 percent. You know that they will be accurate 97 percent of the time, whereas the positive results are only 80 of 125 or an accuracy of 64 percent. Under the best of circumstances, therefore, positive results will be correct only 64 percent of the time. Now this is a statistical argument, obviously. But it should be the assumption on which you as a reader starts, that what you're reading is only going to be true 64, it's going to have a 64 percent likelihood of being true. So let's delve a little bit into the ways in which studies can go awry even beyond that statistical threshold. Stefan Polst has put forth the G1, P1, M1 problem, and that's one graduate student, one problem, and one model. And if you apply that to preclinical studies, um, where one, grad, one trainee, we could say, it doesn't have to be a graduate student, one PI, one model, that results in poorly reproducible results beyond the statistical concerns I've already presented to you. How does this work? 
Well, here's an example of studies on compounds listed here that have been published in the light blue as compared to the results of the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis therapy development institute. What they sought to do was to reproduce the preclinical trials to see how accurately and how well they were done, how robust the findings were. And when you look at their ability to reproduce the data, it's virtually nil. So the published results showed highly positive changes in outcomes, whereas there was a failure to reproduce all those findings. What happens when those compounds get into clinical trials and are being tested in humans? Forget about the ethics of cost. Forget about the ethics of safety, both of which are very important, obviously. Those drugs are going to fail in all likelihood. So that means that we are entering compounds into clinical trials based on poorly reproducible preclinical results. It's costly, it's unethical, and it leads to a reduction in research and development efficacy over time. It's not just true in ALS. Uh, if you look at the reproducibility of preclinical trials in any number of therapeutic areas, they are almost uniformly poorly reproducible. There are lots of reasons why preclinical trials, I listed them on the previous slide, may fail. They may be poorly randomized. They may not be blinded. What about clinical trials and inherent biases included in them? This is kind of complicated, so I'm going to walk you through this step by step. This was a depression trial, so not something we would necessarily do in our field, but I think it's pertinent. On the top are ratings done before the clinical trial, and on the bottom are results after the clinical trial. What we're looking at are the physician ratings of persons who may enter the trial in terms of the Hamilton D depression rating scale and how the patients rate themselves on that scale. And the graph in between is the correlation. Before the trial started, no one had a depression score lower than 20. The higher the score, the more depressed someone is. No one, according to the physicians. You might guess what the Hamilton D score to get into the trial was. Right, around 20. The patients who rated themselves rated themselves on a bell curve. No correlation. Whereas after the trial, physicians rated on a bell curve and it looks identical to how the patients rated themselves, perfectly correlated. This would appear to show a very robust drug response where none actually existed. This analysis was done after the trial. Typically, these kinds of analyses are never done as part of the clinical trial, and even if they are, they are rarely reported as part of the clinical trial. So this illustrates the bias involved, the human bias involved in clinical trials, and it illustrates a failure in design to take into account those biases and a failure of analysis and or reporting because those aren't part of the reported results that allow proper interpretation of the study results. This goes before the FDA, it would lead to approval even though it may be falsely positive. What about false negative results, where compounds that actually may be helpful never make it to market because you can't demonstrate their effectiveness in clinical trials? So I'm going to show you data from pain trials, and pain is something we deal with often in neurology. Um, and um, my colleague at Rochester, Bob Dworkin, this is actually his area of research, though these are not his data. 
And here are two sets of ratings. Act, these are actual patient ratings um, from a pain trial for chronic pain. And um, on the top, you see the results of people who rate their pain consistently. And for chronic pain, you would imagine a very small range of pain values throughout the day. Here are people who rate their pain inconsistently. This is diabetic neuropathy. Then you would expect this range of pain scores more than these. But with this level of noise, you would hardly ever be able to discern an effect of a drug. Here, if pain went from, let's say, a mean of 8 down to a mean of 2, you would clearly see the result, whereas here you would never be able to discern it. As a consequence, pain researchers are trying to think about better, cleverer ways, including blinding the protocol that they submit to clinicaltrials.gov so that participants can't read it, or instructing their participants how to rate pain more accurately so that they can get consistent results. This is analogous to the stent retriever trials for stroke that restricted the patient population to people with large artery proximal clots, a very narrow segment of the population, simply so that they could discern whether there was an effect of thrombectomy. The equivalent here would be restricting patients to that population who can rate their pain well so that you can then discern the effect of the drug. So false positive results, false negative results, both lead to misleading results that appear in clinical trial data and may either prevent good drugs from getting to market or promote drugs that are not so effective getting to market. Here's something we deal with all the time uh, on a daily basis when people are publishing their results, and that's spin. I showed you a couple of examples before where bias played a part, but honestly, by definition, bias is non-conscious. This is a different kind of bias where I would submit to you that the investigators writing their work up are trying to pull the wool over their own eyes as opposed to trying to pull the wool over someone else's eyes for a marketing advantage. So the problem with results that are reported in a misleading fashion is that they c those that spin can get into the literature can then get into meta-analyses, can then get into guidelines, and the wrong conclusion is promulgated in the literature. Incorrect citations, um, false impressions of utility of the drug, let's say, or the device for the purposes of clinical care. And then once that makes it to insurers and policymakers' guidelines, we all pay the price. Our patients pay the price, and we as prescribers pay a price. Here's a non-inclusive list of types of spin. This is apt to consider now in our heated political season in the United States, uh, but spin exists in the scientific literature all the time. Perhaps a trial fails to show that the new compound is effective, but they did secondary analyses to try to tease out whether a subpopulation responded to the drug even though the trial was not powered to detect those differences. But they emphasized them in the results. What about saying non-significant differences are evidence of equivalence or comparability? Um, I call this the dreaded trend statement. We found a positive trend, P.07. Well, if you've established P.05 as significant, you need to say, uh, if you're being honest, this is, a non -diff this is not different. I don't even think you should say this is a non-significant difference because it's not a difference <laughs> by your own definitions. And then another problem we have is people 
uh, showing that, let's say, a difference of 1% uh, in human populations is statistically significant, but how meaningful is that? How often would we prescribe a seizure medicine, for example, to yield a 1% difference in seizure frequency? Probably not very meaningful. So we deal with all of these and more in trying to provide transparent, accurate reporting. And it's very difficult because people, including editors, want the best, liter the best results in their literature, and there's a tendency to overlook the fundamentals of reporting. So how can we resolve these problems? Well, this is a very nice graphic that came from Nature, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing for you, but um, I'll just point out one, um, the asymmetric attention problem. This is when expected results receive no scrutiny, but unexpected results are ignored. What we need to, we sh what we should be doing is inviting others to look at the data. Um, when we get expected ones, we should be critical about those. And when they're unexpected, we should say, oh, wait, maybe we're missing something. Let's look at those a little bit more closely. The NIH is beginning to insist uh, on gr in grant applications that there be some additional studies to reproduce findings and to follow best practices. Training programs will need to adjust their training for their trainees to instruct them in best practices. We need transparent, complete reporting. And really, for all of you, there needs to be critical reading. This is just a short compendium of the issues involved, but any reading of the literature should try to take these um, into account. I would add that post-publication peer review, correspondence sections of journals are another great way to correct the flaws in the literature when authors and editors miss them. I'll leave this on a positive note. I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them.